Walter, do you still remember our first visit to Syria? I remember, and uh, I remember the trouble we had with the language because we tried to find something to eat and we were looking for olives. And you almost plucked out a tree to show them what you want. <laughs> yes, I tried to <laughs> talk about olives. I tried every language that I knew and they didn't know what an olive was. And eventually we drove through an olive grove and I grabbed a branch from an olive tree and took that to the store and said, I'm looking for this. And then the penny dropped and they said, ah, zetun, zetun. <laughs> so from then on I know what the Arabic for olive is. It's zetun. Tell me, is this a healthy food? No, well, the olive is most wholesome. Mono oils in it and... Uh, so it's, a, it's an excellent food, yes. But of course it needs a process, otherwise it uh, can be impalatable. Yeah. We visited the Omayyad Mosque in Damascus. It's believed that the head of John, which was decapitated, is the in the... John the Baptist, yes. Yeah, is uh, in that shrine. I, I was in that shrine. shrine and I was fascinated to see that there were many who went to pay their respects at that particular shrine where this head is. And uh, wasn't Pope John Paul II also in that mosque? He was there, yes. Yes, and he also visited that particular site. Now, I'm also so interested in, in some of these artifacts and uh, these so-called relics. Uh, there are more relics then there are possibilities of body parts in some of these these saints, <laughs> Francois. Especially when we visited St. Peter's. Absolutely. And there are more pieces of the cross than <laughs> you could probably uh, have a whole forest of, of trees in terms of all of these things. But it's interesting that we find this even in these remote locations. Yeah. And of course... You were the man who looked after our food. Yes. And you, you chose certain foods. Walter, are you perhaps uh, over lacto vegetarian or are you vegan? No, I'm a, I'm a vegan vegetarian and sometimes it's a bit of a challenge, but I think we did just fine. Uh, the Middle East is an amazing place where you can find many, many foods which are magnificent. Thank you. And then we, we came to a place just before we went to Ebla called Sidneya. And uh, you had something to tell us about Sidneya. Of course, they believe that this was the tomb of Abel, the first person to die. But that's just... Uh, that's a mythology. Yes. The antediluvian world was destroyed by a flood, according to the scripture, so there is no way that they could have a tomb of Abel. But then uh, many of these religious systems have relics and beliefs that uh, are mythological. Yeah. Well, Sidnaya was a very interesting place to visit. We looked at a drop of oil. I think it was olive oil, zaytun. Yes. And uh, what did they tell us about the figure that was... You know, these places out? are fascinating. This is a, a Muslim country. And uh, here, a drop of oil fell and apparently transformed itself into the image of Mary. And... Uh, uh, people were fascinated, and this is a place where people come and venerate this particular phenomenon. And I find it fascinating that uh, the two great religious systems seem to have very similar sentiments. You find that uh, both the Catholic world and the Muslim world come to these sites to receive special blessings from these apparitional appearances. And they also have uh, relics there which they claim were paintings done by 
some of the apostles. Yeah, Luke, for instance. Yeah, Luke, for example, was supposed to have drawn this icon of Mary. Now, I have serious doubts whether Luke would have done that because, uh, <laughs> or rather, absolute doubts <laughs> whether he would have done that because these are uh, all painted in the symbology of sun worship of the ancient deities that we found in Babylon where you had father, mother, child. And mother and child worship was basically what the religion revolved around. And should you possess the painting, well, then you, you will receive, be protected. Yes, you receive special blessings. And it's always a question of pilgrimage. Pilgrimage, if you go to the site, you will receive blessings. And this site was particularly interesting. Uh, the whole monastery is built on a hill. Now, as far as the ancient religions were concerned, the ancient pagan religions, they also worshipped on high places. And God was always concerned about this. And uh, when there was a good king, they got rid of the high places. And when there was an apostate king, the high places were restored. And when we were at this particular place, I said to you, remember, I said, Francois, this is a high place. And this monastery has been built on a high place. So there must be ancient sites of worship. Now, the ancients all believed that their deities came out of a cave. And so you find that uh, in Catholicism, Mary also appears out of a cave. Fatima, for example. And the ancient deities always came out of the cave. Whether you go to the Eastern religions, to Japan, or to China, or these religions, there their deities also come out of a cave. And so I went looking for the caves, and yes, indeed, we, we found the caves. This to me was so fascinating. So this is an ancient high place with a monastery on it, worshipping in a modern form the very same things that the ancient worships. You know, Solomon already said there is nothing new under the sun. And when they explained to people how the monastery was located at this very precise site, then uh, it's interesting what history tells us because uh, the king who ordered the construction of this monastery in honor of Mary, he apparently was hunting one day and he shot a gazelle and there's a statue erected in this place of this gazelle. And when he shot the gazelle, it turned into an apparition of Mary and instructed him to build the monastery on that precise site. Now, Francois, would God, the God in heaven, associate himself with a high place and with an ancient place of pagan worship? Or was the instruction rather to separate oneself from that kind of worship? But this is a beautiful example of syncretism. Uh, worshipping the old system in a new form and pretending that it is something else. And the mere fact that people have to go to a place to receive special uh, blessings in what form or other. Salvation by visiting icons. Well, it cuts out, it cuts out most of humanity because this is a God, then, who only gives the blessings to those who can uh, afford or have the means or the, the possibility to visit these places. And uh, you find the same also in Catholicism. You have to go and enter into special holy doors or this and that to receive a special blessing. Or, like uh, Pope Francis once issued an indulgence, for those who followed him on Twitter or gave tweets. Now that means you could only receive the indulgence if you had capacity to uh, have a cell phone. So that cuts out most of humanity and uh, it just doesn't seem to me that God works in this way. 
the God of heaven is accessible to all. And uh, from the, the richest to the poorest, from the weakest to the strongest, from the most uh, brilliant to the most challenged, God is available to all of them. And you don't have to go to a place in order to meet him. You mentioned something interesting, the high places. Now the psalmist pray, I look unto the hills, high places. From where shall my help come from? So that was a very attractive religion, essentially religion. My help comes from the Lord. Thank you for that uh, interesting. Now before we go to uh, Ebla, which is one of the greatest discoveries recently, would you like us to visit another little site? It's on our way. Okay. Right. This is called Malula. 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 Yeah. Can you remember what kind of language they spoke there? This is one of the few places in the world where they still speak Aramaic. Yes, yes. That's the language that Jesus spoke. Yeah, but you know, after 500 years, you have a few slight changes. For instance, the name of God. Yes. Uh, when you read the name of God in ancient uh, uh, Aramaic, it's a little different to the name that Jesus used when he died, Elohim, Elo, Elohi, Elohi. So we shouldn't got bogged down with the specific pronunciation. Of because languages are dynamic. Yes. You're referring to the fact that people think that you have to have the exact uh, pronunciation of a particular name in order to address deity. But if you go to the Bible, then you see plainly that uh, names were changed also in translation. Uh, for example, Peter in Aramaic is Kephas. I don't know whether I pronounced that correctly, but nevertheless, that is what it was. But in Greek, it is Petros. So it was perfectly, and the Bible uses both names for him interchangeably so it was perfectly acceptable to call him kephas in the one language and petros in the other language then certainly it would be acceptable to call him peter in the english language and peter in the german language so there's a difference in the pronunciation and when it comes to the name of, of God, uh, there were certain names in, in the Hebrew that applied to God. And you just mentioned that the, the dialect changed from ancient Aramaic to modern Aramaic or more modern Aramaic in the time of Jesus. And Jesus actually uses the more modern one, which had changed. So if he could change the pronunciation based on the time in which he was living and the language he was using, then the exact way in which to pronounce a name surely cannot be that important in terms of my salvation. So those are some of the issues that people, you know, get so bogged down with. How do I determine that the deity that I am worshipping is the one in the Bible. Well, it's really quite simple. Firstly, the deity in the Bible paid the price for my salvation. And the deity in the Bible is my savior, but he's also my king. There are many people that want to accept the savior, but the king aspect requires obedience. And that same Savior who died on the cross for us spoke in grandeur on Mount Sinai and gave us the law of God. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So salvation also implies that you subject yourself to the kingdom of which he rules, which means you are subject to its rules and ordinances. Yeah. 
And at Ugarit, they use the same names for their gods as we find in Hebrew. Yes. So it's the concept, the character, not the linguistics. Exactly. So a pagan can use a name for God or a pagan religion, which is the same as is used, let's say, in the Bible. But the two are totally different depending on uh, the attributes of that God, the character of that God. So this is how you determine whether you are in harmony with the God of the Bible. If he says, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments, he who says who loves me and keeps not my commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him, and I have not come to abolish the law, etc., not one jot or one tittle will disappear from the law, then the God that I serve is the one that paid the ultimate price for me so that I am saved by grace, not by works. But when I become subject to his kingdom, then I obey his rules. And that determines which deity I'm actually worshipping. Yeah. And then we saw a sign of Takla. But that's another story. It's just a myth. And uh, a warning not to smoke in that uh, holy place. What does Takla mean, Francois? Takla is a, is, a, is a lady. She was associated with Paul, if I remember correctly. And they persecuted her, and she ran to Malula. And when she came there, the rock, the mountain just Opened split. up. Yeah, and she ran through. And these are one of the proofs that this must be the true spot or the true place of worship, etc., etc. These are, God doesn't need manifestations of this nature in order to endear himself. The Bible says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, if I accept God by his word, I don't have to have evidence of his word. I don't have to say to him, prove to me that you love me by giving me some miraculous uh, experience. Because he's already proved that he loves me by dying for me on the cross. And the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the faith takes God at his word and I don't really have to have these manifestations. A wicked generation requires a sign. Yes, but uh, the, the sign we saw there, no smoking, how do you relate? Of course, you were not allowed to smoke there, Walter. Oh, Francois, but you were also not allowed to dress in short pants, etc., etc. So, uh, respect for deity is important in all religions. How much more so should it be an important factor when it comes to the creator of the entire universe? I remember when I was summoned before the rectorate of the university once, and uh, I'd never been to such prominent people before, I decided that I would have to purchase a suit which I didn't possess. And so I dressed up in a suit, which I actually abhorred, but I did it to show respect. Yeah. And then one day when I was in, 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 a, in the church, dressed in jeans and t-shirt, it just dawned on me that for an earthly official I will wear a suit, and for the king of the universe I dress as I please. And... Uh, for a personal position, I, I decided that I would also try to honor the deity that I serve with appearance. And you know that he says that the body is the temple of God and that we shouldn't uh, put things into that body which can harm it. So that's an important thing too. So, no, not smoking is not a bad idea, Francois. So, we give them credit. We give them credit. And yes. then we met the, uh, the priest there. I was there before, and then I asked him, please, would you recite? Can you remember? Yes. Uh, he was able to, well, to pray the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. 
And uh, to think that this language is virtually extinct, it only lives in this little pocket still, to hear the language that Jesus spoke in and probably or maybe used uh, to bring the Lord's Prayer, that must have been quite something. Yeah, and we heard him pray, Our Father. Abunah ti veshmo, yechkata sheshmach, yethele malkach, chitkan irotshach, ech veshmo chi valara, apesh lehmach. That's a, that's a beautiful prayer, by the way. So, Walter, I still remember the moment we stopped at Ebla. Because Ebla is so important. And uh, we were stood there, and uh, then the guide told us that they discovered three editions of the Gilgamesh epic. Yes. Enuma Elish, when above. So, uh, this is so important to, to get the entire picture of the ancient world and, and Abram who lived in those days. I, I, I was fascinated actually by the Gilgamesh epic. It's a, it's a phenomenal you know, piece of information. You took pictures from it in the British Museum. By That's the way. right. Now, What's fascinating there is that uh, they describe the activities that are involved in the worship of the sun god. Shamash. And one of, the, one of the activities is to take an image of the sun god, which is a round object, and to put this round object into a hole or into a uh, receptacle, and this was a sport. So they, they even had round balls with lights in them that used to be kicked around, and if it went into the opponent's net, then it symbolized the victory of the sun god over evil. Mm, and, that's interesting. And so they played these sports, and they used sticks to take a round object and to hit it precisely so that it would go into a particular hole. And if it went into the particular hole, then it was a symbol of the victory of the sun god over evil. So the modern sports that we play are actually based on pagan religious uh, activities. Really? And, uh, you know, if you take a, a baseball setup, even the way in which it is set up is set up in, in the form of sun worship and zodiac worship. And cosmic eggs, for example, were not round because an egg is not round. It had an oblong appearance. And so they also played with cosmic eggs which were round, or which weren't round, but which were oblong. And and we have sports today, which are uh, serious contact sports, <laughs> where an oblong object is the one that you are, you know, determined to to place into particular positions. So the origin of the modern world and the activities of the modern world is not that much different from the ancient world. Man, this is interesting. And of course, they discovered. Thousands, 20,000 clay tablets. Not everyone is deciphered yet or translated. Well, they'll have a hard time deciphering because ISIS has distributed them across the world like a deck of cards that's gone lost. <laughs> and it's interesting when you read the language, there's a little hand telling you go down and then come up. They've got different ways of... And what I love about this place... This is where you took a few pictures, Walter. You had a kind of a... A, a twitch a, in my a nervous, finger. A nervous situation there, but I, I appreciate the material. They discovered different gods. That's also mentioned in Bible, like uh, the Shemesh, that's the Hebrew for the sun. They call it Shamash. They have uh, Chemoshes. Chemos as well. 
So the, 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 the deities in the Old Testament, they found the names at Ebla. So all those deities that are mentioned in the Old Testament are substantiated again by the archaeology. Yes. And Bible names, Abram, etc., you, you find there. And place names like Sodom and Gomorrah. And what's interesting, they call Jerusalem Salem. So when in the book of Genesis, Melchizedek is called the king of Salem. Salem. So they use that name in that time period. And this is what I love about the Bible, bringing out these small details and archaeology can confirm it. So even the name change from Salem to Jerusalem, even that we find substantiated in the archaeology. Yes. And people say that this is a book of myths. It, it's astounding. Yeah. At uh, Ur in the Chaldeans, Ur of the Chaldeans in Iraq, when they excavated there, Ebla is mentioned. So the archaeologists went around looking for Ebla and they found it in 64, an Italian archaeologist. And you, the, the, the pieces come together. Uh, it's fascinating to read this stuff. We cannot talk too much about it. There's too much to say about it. But uh, names like Lakish that they've discovered in Israel, you know, it was mentioned there, and now they've excavated all these sites. And uh, they also mention, of course, Mari. And they mention Kargimesh, Aleppo, Yucharit. And all these people, these different city-states, they corresponded with one another. And it's so interesting to read the correspondence, and then you get the picture of the world that Abram lived in. Now, just read one of the songs that were discovered there by Peter Natu. He translated it in English. It reads, Lord of heaven and earth. The earth was not. You created it. The light of day was not. You created it. This is what I love. It's a polytheistic society, but there was a song composed. The God created. So long before <laughs> we got evolution, the ancients says God. And this this uh, ties in with the Sumerian, the Babylonian uh, hymns of creation. Now the further you go back, Francois, in time, the closer you actually get to what the Bible is talking about. Uh, I remember you once spoke about law. Yes. And the various laws that we have. And the further you go back in time, the more honorable the law is and the closer it is to the biblical paradigms. Yeah. For instance, Hammurabi, the laws there, they're awkward. But when you go back, it becomes more like the Ten Commandments. So they were faithful people in those days, still believed. But this was a tremendous visit to the Idlib Museum. And what's interesting, from Mari, they imported songs. Okay. And they sang these songs at Ebla. And uh, I wish we had the, the music, the melody, and the lyrics. But... Mari, and we were there with that strong car, produced some songs for Ebla. This so Mari was a city of culture. Yes. And Walter, the picture of Idlib, the museum, is not the same because ISIS came and destroyed it. Everything is gone. That's a that's rather a tragedy. It is. We walked around Idlib Museum and we took a few pictures, but there's nothing left. And I still recall that the symbolism that we found there 
of those ancient religions, that exact same symbolism can be found in the modern religions. So Solomon again was right, nothing new under the sun. Yes, and then we moved up to Aleppo, where we visited the National Archaeological Museum, and we took a few pictures. I want you to read from the Bible, 2 Kings 17, verse 6. Now, in uh, 722, Sargon destroyed Samaria, and he took the captives to Assyria. And the Bible gives us the exact place where they eventually were exiled to. 2 Kings 17, verse 6. It reads, in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. Now, this, this is fascinating. The Bible tells the story. You go to the Assyrian annals, and they say it was... Two of them fought against uh, Samaria. It took them three years before they captured that capital of the ten tribes. But in the last year, the third year, Shalmaneser V died. So Sargon got the credit of conquering the ten tribes. Mm -hmm. And then he took them, 722 BC, to these sites. So archaeologists went to these sites, and they discovered this is what the Bible said. It's true. But, Francois, excuse me if I may interpose here. I find this very fascinating, particularly in the light of some of the modern ideologies which we have in the world. It says here, and we've just read it, that in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Hala by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. Which means, Francois, that he captured them and he spread them around the Mede area, which is in the east. Yes. Now, we have ideologies in the world today which claim that the lost tribes of Israel packed up their bags and went on a march and went west. And that we find the descendants of the lost tribes in uh, not the east, but in the west. And so you have the story of British Israelitism, which believed that the, the British Isles and the British people, for example, are descendants of these lost tribes. And even uh, you know, the, the kings and the queens attribute these titles to them as if they are from the Davidic line and that they uh, come from the tribes of Israel. And then there are others that believe that all the European nations are the descendants of these lost tribes. And then you have others who believe, no, 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 these lost tribes were, were other nations, like African nations, for example, and that the true Israelites are of African stock. And I was so fascinated in, in our own country when uh, some of the, what they, they call them, the black Hebrews, came down and they were uh, pompously uh, greeted with great ceremony by the president of, of South Africa. And this idea that uh, to belong to these lost tribes and to be you know, the receivers of the, of the promises and the salvation that will come with it, you have to be part and parcel of that organization. So there's such a dichotomy. Some believe that you have to be British to be part of the lost tribes. Some believe that you could be part of any European nation to be part of the lost tribes. Some believe that you have to be African to be part of the lost tribes. And there are even people in the East 
in uh, the Chinas who say, no, you have to be part of uh, them to be part of the lost tribes. And it seems as if people today want to further this religion that God has a small group of people that are literal descendants of the Israels who alone are open to salvation. But my Bible says every tribe and people and nation that the gospel had to go to the whole world. Go ye into how much of the world? All the 90%. world. 90%. 90%. Oh. So did Christ die only for the lost children of Israel? Now I know that Jesus said that and he said uh, to the disciples, go ye first to the lost children of Israel. And people take this verse and they say, so salvation is only for the Israelites. But then he also went to Tyre and he spoke to uh, non-Israelites there. And uh, he, he showed, even in the Old Testament times, that people could be saved that were not part of Israel, I think. Isaiah 56. Of, yes, for example, the, Isaiah says it quite clearly that the heathen nations will become and they'll have a place better than sons and daughters. House of all nations. A house of all nations. So this philosophy is, is misunderstood because they misunderstood the prophecy where Daniel predicted that there would be a specific time allotted for the Jews to, to bring the gospel of salvation in typology to the world. And uh, Jesus said, Go ye first to the lost children of Israel. But when they stoned Stephen, that's when the gospel went to the heathen. Because that's when Peter received this vision of the sheet with the unclean animals coming down. And people say, well, thereby Jesus declared all unclean meats clean. And people can eat whatever they want. But that's not what Peter did. He didn't jump up and go and uh, buy unclean meat to eat. While he was wondering what the vision meant, and he'd seen it three times, the, there was a knock on the door and there were three representatives of Cornelius, who was uh, a Roman and a pagan in their eyes. And that's why he saw it three times, because there were three individuals. And he told them that the Spirit had told them to go with them. When he came to Cornelius, he said to Cornelius, you know that it is forbidden for a Jew to associate with a Gentile, but God has shown me in vision that I from mm. must call no man unclean or impure. And at the same time, Paul receives this miraculous uh, experience with Jesus Christ and he is called the apostle to the Gentiles. So probation and this uh, ability to be the, the sole presenters of the gospel was shifted from the Jews to the Gentiles. And as we discussed in an earlier discussion, it seems to me that very soon the time of the Gentiles will also come to an end because they will follow the same route and say, we have no king but Caesar. So this whole philosophy seems to be refuted by this very text. Marvelous. Because these people, they didn't remain an independent nation. They were a conquered people placed in cities to separate them and break them apart and to keep them from their unity, which was always a harassment to the Assyrians. And they were dissipated into the and taken up into the general populace and there are no lost tribes of Israel. So if you want to be Israel today, then the Bible says you have if you want to be Abraham's seed, you have to accept Christ. Yes. You know what well, Titus two verse eleven says that the Saving salvation of God has appeared to all men. Do you think this is possible? You know, Francois... Is God inclusive or exclusive? You know, there are people that say that Christianity is, is just a fraction 
of the religious systems of the world. And uh, Jesus gave the commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And we have preachers that say, and historians that say, that we haven't done that. All these other nations that have never ever heard of, uh, of Jesus Christ, like nations in the East, like Japan and all of these, have they had an opportunity? Now, you know what? I believe history has covered up the facts. The early disciples, already in their zeal to spread the gospel, have reached the far corners of the earth. Armenia, we saw there. Armenia, but uh, the Apostle Thomas reached India. And there you had the Thomasite Christians who kept the Sabbath, by the way. Mm. And when uh, uh, Francis Xavier, the co-founder of the Jesuits, traveled around Africa with Vasco da Gama, remember we used to learn that in history in the schools? Yeah. And to find the trade routes of the East, Francis Xavier went along. And when he came to India, he found these Thomasite Christians who claimed that they had received the gospel from Thomas directly, and they knew nothing about a pope. And they kept the Sabbath, and this totally infuriated Francis Xavier, and he commissioned the Inquisition in Goa to destroy this form of Christianity. In ancient China, there are documents of Christian heritage in Japan, Many of the, the writing forms that we find originate from Christian heritage, which apparently was very prominent in early Japan mm. and in China, and later, through the shoguns, was taken back and re-paganized. So all the nations actually had an opportunity to embrace Christianity. And Christianity in the church in the wilderness was spread across the entire globe. We read marvelous uh, writings of, of, of the ancient battles and the kings and uh, the, the conquering of nations where all of these kings were actually associated with Christianity and knew about the Sabbath and the church in the East and in Medo-Persia and all the way to India and into China and uh, the far corners of the earth and even to the West. The ancient churches there, they were Sabbath-keeping uh, Christians in, in, in Ireland. Uh, St. Patrick, it is claimed that he is a Catholic saint and that he visited uh, the Vatican. There is no evidence of that whatsoever, but there is evidence that he was a Sabbath-keeping Christian. So the world has had an opportunity to be evangelized and there has been a counteractivity to reclaim the territory gained by the early church. And in the end, God will repeat this drive in the three angels' messages because the Bible says that the three angels' messages will be preached to every people, tribe, and language, and tongue. And it will be manifested in a way that we cannot even fathom. I believe the modern media is going to play a prominent part. Mm. And I think uh, in the various nations now, God has people that are silently working because the kingdom of heaven is not by demonstration. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. And it's slowly permeating the nations. And when the crunch comes, and the choice will have to be made, and a loud cry will go out that we must worship God who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water, and do not accept the mark of the beast, and do not follow a system of syncretism, etc., etc., then people will make a decision and every single tribe on this planet will be represented on that sea of glass. That's what I believe. Do you think I'm far Beautiful. off? Beautiful. This is God. He's, 
inclusive, not exclusive. I, I think so that. too. <clears throat> so Walter, when we stood before that National Museum in Aleppo, this was a design, a, a replica of the temple the, the, the exiles saw in Tel Halaf. So some more Bible proof that the ten tribes disappeared to these different places. So they were dissipated and they're gone. And any form of religion which relies on exclusivity, salvation by lineage, salvation by heritage, salvation by language, salvation by pronunciation, is not biblical. Salvation on his character. Salvation is by grace. And God is not a respecter of persons. God is one who pours out his grace on all of humanity and he doesn't force anyone. He gives everyone freedom of choice. If this kind of religion is true, then you don't even have a choice as to whether you are saved or whether you are not saved because if you are of that bloodline, you're going to be saved whether you like it or not. Fatalism. It's a dangerous form of religion. Yeah. Takes it's an out. onslaught on the character of God. Yeah. One time I came to Aleppo and I usually go to the citadel. At this specific time, I saw this huge pipe coming from the top, a few of them with rubbish at the bottom, coming out at the bottom, and I knew exactly what was happening there. Because scholars s thought that there must be some Hittite and Amorite evidences at, uh, at the citadel, but nobody ever started. And then the Germans came along, and they started to excavate. And this is when I was there that specific year. And I went up, and I saw some of the stuff that they discovered. So I they were know. washing the, the artifacts and cleaning them of the debris, and this was the rubbish that you saw, the water with the yes, filthy yes, stuff coming I, out? Yes, I took the stuff in my hand. And I also believe that there must be Hittite and Amorite uh, evidences up there. So I spoke to a, a German archaeologist, a lady. She didn't give me much because they've just started the excavations. So she told me where it's, it happened, so I went there. And Walter, we went down. Yes. And I saw stuff. I, I suppose I wasn't allowed to, to go in there and use the material. But I took pictures. And I had two friends with me, and they actually they actually took the pictures for me, and I, I saw this strange figures. And again, I went back to two universities. Please tell me, can you identify these gods and the language? And they couldn't. And then I contacted a friend of mine in Japan. And there was a scholar who who specialized only in Hittite history and uh, language. So I got the, the message back that this was the Battle of Karkar in 853, where Shalmaneser III met a coalition of 12 nations. By the way, a coalition of 12 nations does not specify the number, but it's just a a way of speaking. There were only 11. And I was so excited because I was at Karkar, where Shalmaneser III saw Ayyab face to face. And in the Kut Stili... So was Shalmaneser against this coalition and Ahab was part of the coalition? Yes. He was extending his empire. Remember you gave me a a slide that you took in the British Museum, the black obelisk that was discovered in Kala, Namrut, in Iraq, Iraq where you, what did you see on that? Yes. Five lines? Jehu, paying tribute to Shalmaneser III. So after eight years, he, he didn't manage to conquer Israel in 583, but ten years later, he, he made. The Bible is so fascinating. And this 
was the story of the Battle of Karkar. But I couldn't get any info. But recently, the Germans published the story of the excavation on the citadel of Aleppo. And they discovered that this was the temple of Hadad, the storm god. OK. He's also called Cheshup. He's also called Baal. He's also called Bel. So <laughs> different gods with the same character. That was a universal. Uh, Walter, I cannot tell you how excited I am. I've been to the site. I've got the stuff. <laughs> and uh, to think that the critics originally claimed that there was no Hittite nation, because right. it only occurred in the Bible. Yes. And here, we, you and I are looking at Hittite. And there must have been a powerful nation, because the Egyptians even wrote letters to the Hittites requesting uh, a unity. Yeah, and remember the widow of Tutankhamun. Yes. We, we were there at Tel, Tel El Amarna. She sent an email to Supi Luli Umas. Supi, that, Lulu, Supi Luli Umas. Umas. Yeah. At that stage, when he received the request, she wanted to marry one of his sons, he was fighting Carchemish. He was trying to conquer Carchemish. And it took him a year before he and we've been to Carcamas, before he, he gained the victory. So he sent one of his sons, and the Egyptians didn't like their queen to marry a Hittite, so they killed him on the way. But for the first time, we read about the Hittites. And this is Ankensen Paten, who changed the name to Ankensen Amun, writing the letter. They've got the clay tablets. <laughs> so when, they, when she changed her name, she actually switched deities. Yeah. So from yeah. Artanism, who was a monotheistic deity, she switched back to polytheism. Yeah. The now, pressure of the, the priests of Karnak. I now say, today, you change, yeah, if, yeah. You, if you venerate a saint, uh, when the Bible says the dead know nothing, and that uh, you may not consult them, then you are actually doing exactly the same as the ancients did, isn't that right? Yeah. By the way, Akhenaten believed in the soul sleep oh. of a person. Okay. And he, he wrote he wrote a poem of which seventeen lines corresponds to Psalms 104. Which was the Psalm of Moses. No, no. This, I, I don't know who the author was. I have to check that. But the point is, he also believed that God created everything in this beautiful hymn. So I went to Karkar, I've been there, and uh, this is another story. But it's fascinating how everything fits together. Looking at uh, the warriors on the relief at Kargemesh, a thought of the way we can conquer. I've got two enemies, main enemies. I think the biggest enemy is self. Myself, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've got a few other enemies who just don't like me, Walter. They detest me. But, Francois, the Bible says, woe to you if all men speak well of you. So maybe that's not such a bad thing. So... Yes, it keeps you humble. Justification by faith is laying man's glory in the dust and doing for him what he cannot do for himself. For himself. Remember once you phoned me, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> you said, I'm in the dust. I said, Walter, just try and get a few filters, man. <laughs> but uh, stay there and get the message. <laughs> Good. So, dear listener, if you need a profile of God. Please read the Bible. And Jesus came to, to explain the character of the Father. He is not a cruel judge. He loved you so much that he gave his son. By the way, God killed Christ. 
so that you and I can be saved. May God bless you and give you a greater appetite to read the most wonderful book. You can believe everything, and if there's not evidences, it will come. The spade confirms the book. Thank you.